the misinformation coming from Edison and the NRC is so skillfully put together to divert attention away from the true nature of these disasters and to give people a false sense that these agencies actually have things under control. It's the complete opposite. These agencies, either they don't know what they're talking about or they just don't care about public safety and human health. And so my sense of it is we're on our own. We're on our own and we need to speak out. And that's really what we're doing when we go and we talk to these city councils. Yes, there's a, there's a ratepayer cost issue, which is very important. But first and foremost is my instinctive response to protect my family. And what I see is an almost sociopathic detachment when I hear these emergency planners from Edison misinform entire city governments and, and city councils about the nature of these disasters. They, they say things like, like, well, not all radiation is dangerous. Or they'll say, they'll say, we have a multi-agency coordination plan in place to protect you. But then when you, when you probe a little bit farther, they say, well, actually, it's, it only goes out 10 miles, and we're thinking about reducing it to only two-mile radius around the power plant. Now, given the dis scale of the disaster that we're just seeing in Fukushima, the Prime Minister of Japan, Naoto Kan, was thinking about evacuating out to 160 miles out and evacuating Tokyo, the largest city in the world, with a population of 36 million people. They're telling us here, Edison's telling us, we well, only have to worry about two miles out. This is absolutely, this is, these, are, these are deadly misinformations that they're, that, they're, that they're spreading through the public. My background is design. Um, I have a, a background in architecture from USC. I also studied at the graduate level at Harvard. I have two degrees at Harvard. There, it was, the curriculum was actually specially crafted to look at the built environment and the natural systems. So I did, I did two degrees there. It was, a, it was a somewhat unique curriculum. But what I was looking at, I was looking at the impact of the built environment on the natural systems and vice versa. Um, I've been working as, a, as an architect, an urban designer, an urban planner. Uh, I'd call myself a community-based planner um, here in San Diego. And when I got involved in the Fukushima uh, issue, or ra rather the nuclear issue in general, it was because I was watching the Fukushima disaster unfolding on television and I was hearing news coming from our elected officials all the way up at the federal level. And they were telling us that there's no chance of any radioactive fallout at any dangerous levels reaching us here in the United States. I had a planning firm in the Caribbean for eight years and we had this event called Tequila Sunrises. And Tequila Sunrises are when the Sahara Desert has winds sweep across the surface of the, of, the, of the desert and lift millions of tons of sand aloft. So high it gets carried in the jet stream, 6,000 miles across open ocean, and it descends on the Lesser Antilles all the way up into uh, South Florida, Cuba and South Florida. And what it is is these particles of sand, heavy particles of sand travel across open ocean. And as the sun comes up, they look like fantastic sunsets. So I knew that, from my own experience, that large amounts of heavy material can travel thousands of miles across open ocean in just a matter of days. And I'm listening to this news coming from our officials, and I'm watching these nuclear reactors exploding in Japan. And I said to my wife, Lindsay, I said, Lindsay, I think we're in trouble. The jet stream travels this way, and as I'm watching the, the weather reports, I'm seeing that the jet stream is swinging to the south. Usually it runs up farther to the northwest of the United States. For some strange reason, it was swinging down to the south. And I thought to myself, could this really be happening? Three nuclear reactors in a critical stage, melting down. And I have three small children. I actually lived in Germany and Europe in 88 and 89, just after the Chernobyl disaster. And I remember the people that I lived with in Germany when I was working there scrubbed all their fruits and vegetables vigorously under the sink to try to remove the cesium-137 from the surface of their uh, leafy greens and their fruits. So as I'm watching this happen in Japan and I'm watching the TV and I'm listening to the misinformation, I told Lindsay, I said, Lindsay, we need to get a Geiger counter. I don't think we're going to get accurate information from our elected officials. So we went out and bought a Geiger counter. 
uh, I didn't realize that the fallout was going to come across the Pacific Ocean so fast. Well, by the time we got to Geiger counter, the first thing we did is we checked the food in our refrigerator. And sure enough, we had a gallon of milk and we had probably consumed three quarters of it. And uh, I checked it and the Geiger counter detected radiation. It was clicking kind of vigorously. And I, I looked at my wife and I said, I think we've been feeding our kids radioactive milk. And I think that's when I became uh, active, realizing that these disasters can happen 5,500 miles away and affect my children in San Diego. So it was at that point I decided to dig into the research on my own and find out what's actually happening in Fukushima. And then it didn't take long before I turned my attention on the nuclear power plant that we have just up the coast here at San Onofre. It's right at the edge of North County, San Diego, South Orange County, about 30 miles from our house. I am still very concerned about global climate change. And a lot of the things that I look at here in San Diego address those issues of being more efficient with our energy choices. But the nuclear issue was never on my radar screen. I was not an anti-nuclear activist prior to learning about what's happening in Fukushima and now what I've learned about San Onofre here. Anybody who knows now what I know would label themselves an anti-nuclear activist. I think out of just a sense of self-preservation and survival, most people would come to that same conclusion. As a matter of fact, a number of us have gone to the city councils in the surrounding cities around the power plant and have shared information about the dangers of San Onofre, the San Onofre nuclear generating station. And while city councils at first are a little reluctant to address the issue, once we present enough information to them, and a lot of this information comes from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission itself, what we get is we get unanimous votes from these city councils, 5-0 votes in favor of putting pressure on Southern California Edison to shut the power plant down and decommission it. Maybe the biggest thing is the fact that you can't outrun a nuclear disaster. We have 8.4 million people living within 50 miles of San Onofre. That was the, the, the radius of the evacuation zone prescribed by the U.S. State Department for U.S. citizens living in Japan at the time of the triple nuclear meltdowns in Fukushima back in March of 2011. If you impose that 50 mile radius around San Onofre, you encompass five counties and 8.4 million people who are completely clueless about the potential disaster at the power plant. One of the things that I learned was that the power plant has stored all of its spent fuel since it opened on site. It's never been shipped off site. It has spent fuel pools, two of them, behind the reactors, a couple hundred yards from the I-5 freeway. The I-5 freeway is the main north-south artery through California. These fuel pools are called quadruple racked, which means they built racks inside these fuel pools to hold four times more spent fuel than they were designed to hold. Spent fuel is highly irradiated fuel. It's the analogy that I've heard, which is a very accurate one, is it's the difference between the, the, the cold briquettes that you put in a barbecue and the white hot coals that you pull out of a barbecue. These fuel rods, when they come out, are extremely deadly, and they're put in spent fuel pools for up to 10 years to cool off before they're put in dry cast storage. These racks, these, these quadruple racks uh, fuel pools are holding four times more spent fuel than they were designed to hold. The disaster in Fukushima was triggered by a mega quake. We have offshore here. It runs off from La Jolla, it runs up the coast here. Out here at Solana Beach, it's about two and a half miles off the beach, offshore. It's one of the major components of the San Andreas fault system. I've also learned recently that there was a, a 2005 study done by a man named Gerald Kuhn about paleoseismic features of tsunami evidence in large earthquake events in the past. And what he says is that we have a history here in North County, San Diego, extending all the way up to where the power plant is, of tsunamis, very large tsunamis, where the remnants of these tsunamis exist way back up inside of the estuaries, the several coastal estuaries that we have here along North County, San Diego. 
The Indonesian earthquake was off of uh, it was off of uh, Banda Aceh, and it was several. It was maybe I, I want to say it was 60 miles offshore. It was a considerable, maybe 40 to 60 miles offshore. I'd have to check that. Um, and then the other uh, uh, tsunami, the Great Sendai earthquake and tsunami that was triggered off of Fukushima. Um, I believe that was about 80 miles offshore. This this fault out here apparently is the source of the tsunamis according to the, the paleoseismic report and the researcher um, hypothesized that it was underwater canyon landslides that triggered these events close to shore and, and, and thus the large run up that was, he talks about it going 100 meters um, above the existing edges of the uh, coastal estuaries and lagoons. So these were large events. The power plant sits at sea level. It's on the beach. It actually sits down at beach level. It has a seawall in front of it, which is about 14 feet above high tide. So the, this facility has uncanny similarities with the conditions that we saw at Fukushima. In fact, there were studies at Fukushima by a man named Koji Minora. He was a researcher who found the same kind of tsunami de deposits, paleoseismic tsunami deposits two miles inland around the power plant and had warned TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric and Power Company, that their, their power plant, uh, the Fukushima Daiichi power plant, was sitting in a tsunami zone. And they were, he was ignored for 20 years. And when he was interviewed after the disaster, they asked him, they asked him uh, about his studies and he just responded, it's too late. And I think we have an opportunity here to heed the warnings of Fukushima and the fact that we have the same kind of tsunami deposits here. Those tsunami deposits were the result of large seismic events. I want to say also there was a recent article that came out in the journal Nature. And there was another recent earthquake off of um, Indonesia in May, I believe, of this year. And it was an 8.6 on a strike-slip fault zone. Based on this article and some comments that were made at Caltech, that event was 70 times larger than what they thought was possible on a strike-slip fault zone, like the one that runs right off of San Onofre. San Onofre was originally designed, my understanding, the, the, the um, design basis for the power plant was a 6.0 earthquake originally. They said they upgraded it, did seismic upgrades to make it uh, uh, able to withstand a 7.0 earthquake. Now, the understanding is, the most current understanding of these strike-slip faults, like the one offshore of the power plant, is that they could be capable of 8.6 earthquakes, which is 70 times larger than, than uh, the upgraded version of the power plant. I have a lot of doubts as an architect whether or not you could actually retrofit a power plant. Once you cast things in concrete, all the rebar, all the structural rebar is cast in place, you might be able to retrofit some of the fittings and things outside of the power plant, but the actual structures, I think, once, you, once you've cast them in concrete, they're, they're, they're whatever they were when you, when you built them, which I believe was a 6.0. For the last year and a half, a number of community groups have worked together to try to bring this uh, issue of the potential dangers of San Onofre to as many people in Southern California as possible. And what we've done is we've gone to city council meetings and we've presented our findings to these city councils. Now, city councils don't have any jurisdiction over the safety of nuclear power plants. And that was conveniently done through federal preemption of the safety issue of nuclear power plants. It's all handled by what's called the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And, and so local jurisdictions really have no say in how safe or unsafe these power plants are operated. But what they do have jurisdiction over is the safety of their residents. And what needs to be made clear is that when a, you have a, a, a nuclear disaster at one of these facilities, the disaster is not contained within the power plant boundaries, which then as this disaster spills out into surrounding communities at a speed, it could be a speed of 916 miles per hour, as we saw with the Fukushima disaster, the plume traveled that fast, I mean 916 miles per day. Is, is that surrounding communities could be impacted very quickly. Now, what, what I found is that these surrounding communities have been misinformed by Southern California Edison about the nature of nuclear disasters. In fact, um, I would call it almost criminal 
the way Edison goes around and presents the safety of the power plant as being um, uh, uh, well managed. Uh, uh, they say that they have several layers of uh, public safety protection in place and that their emergency planning is going to be effective. What I found actually in, in uh, researching emergency planning related to a nuclear disaster at San Onofre is that um, uh, all the assumptions that the emergency plans are based on are completely off by at least a magnitude of 10 in terms of understanding the scale and speed of these disasters and understanding the permanence of these disasters from an urban planning, urban design point of view. There's nothing that comes close to the total destruction of these nuclear disasters. In other words, the exclusion zones that are created by the radioactive fallout wipes clean all the land improvements that society creates over generations in a way that not even war does. You can go in and rebuild after war, as devastating as war is, but you can't go in and rebuild after one of these nuclear disasters. You basically abandon all those improvements. That, that's all the public infrastructure, the public buildings, the private buildings. These are hospitals, universities, schools, homes. So all these things are rendered worthless in a matter of just a few hours. And I think that most people surrounding the power plant have no idea, but that's what we're observing right now in Fukushima. Entire towns are abandoned. You've got a thousand square kilometers of highly contaminated land, and then you have far greater amount of land that's contaminated in a way that will have health impacts on the residents of those other outlying areas. Um, none of that has been discussed by Edison. None of that's discussed in their emergency plans. And as I go and I talk to emergency coordinators in San Diego and Orange County, I realize they don't have the equipment to deal with a nuclear uh, disaster. They, they don't even they don't even have the the equipment within their their fire trucks. They have dosimeters, but they're not prepared to help anybody in the case of an emergency. Really, I think they're going to be marched into harm's way, just like the emergency responders were in 9-11 in New York when they were marched up those towers. They weren't given the right information about that potential disaster. And as a result, you know, we, we had a huge loss of life just within the emergency responders. I think we have the same kind of potential disaster at the power plant. Um, I know that right now they're trying to keep the emergency evacuations or emergency plannings, as they call it, the EPZ, at 10 miles. Um, that in itself is uh, intentionally designed not to address public safety, but to address the issue of liability of the power plant. This has something to do with what's called the Price-Anderson Act, which is the indemnification of our nuclear power industry against the catastrophic economic losses that would be created by a nuclear disaster. In other words, if that power plant was responsible for the type of scale of disaster that they're, they're capable of inflicting on surrounding communities, that industry would never exist in the first place. So what the Price-Anderson Act did originally back in the early 50s, what it, it said, in order to get private investment into this industry to create these power plants, we're going to basically indemnify you against catastrophic disasters. So the fund is very small. I believe it has about $12 billion in it. $12 billion, if you talk about destroyed infrastructure and uh, uh, land improvements, is about the size, if you talk about these coastal communities, that's a small, very small town. But if you look at the Fukushima disaster, which they say now will run up to about $500 billion in lost uh, land value infrastructure and improvements, that disaster that's $500 billion in Japan, this was the point I was going to make, is 20% of the fallout from that disaster. And that was because that power plant sits on the coast with an offshore wind con prevailing wind condition. That disaster that you see is the result of about 18% or 
of the radioactive fallout actually traveling back over land. Here at San Onofre, it's the complete opposite. We have a prevailing westerly on the west coast, which means almost all of the fallout from a nuclear disaster within quadruple racks fuel, fuel spent fuel pools would be traveling into Southern California's urbanized areas. And then back over into Nevada, Utah, Arizona, traveling. If it traveled as fast and as far as it did to Fukushima, it would be the fallout from San Onofre would be out in the Atlantic somewhere within about five or six days, potentially covering a path across the United States. Nobody talks about that. We talk about 10 mile emergency planning zones. We talk about a $12 billion fund. We're looking at potentially doing trillions of dollars worth of damage from one facility. Now the discussion at San Onofre is about how we should try to keep this power plant open given the fact that even right now it has damaged uh, steam generators. Four newly installed steam generators that are less than two years old have failed. And according to independent nuclear experts, the amount of failure or, or um, defects in these steam generators is unprecedented. So we have terribly damaged steam generators and I gotta say steam generators are part of the primary cooling system for the nuclear reactor core. This is a very serious issue. Edison right now wants to restart nuclear damaged nuclear reactor unit number two in order to protect its investment of the steam generators which is around 670 million dollars. In other words to protect less than a billion dollars in capital investment, they're willing to risk potentially $500 billion in damage to surrounding communities because Edison's been warned by independent nuclear experts that they're risking a nuclear disaster at San Onofre right now. The most important message that we bring to city councils right now is that we have a very dangerous condition at San Onofre that's very similar to the conditions at Fukushima. We have a captured regulatory agency, the NRC, that is not doing its job. The power plant has the worst safety record of all 104 nuclear reactors in the U.S. It has the worst record of retaliation against whistleblower employees who come forward with serious uh, uh, concerns about safety at the power plant. And so we have a potential disaster at the power plant which is exacerbated by the fact that in just a few days Southern California is going to have an exercise called the Great California Shakeout, which is the largest earthquake preparedness drill in world history. The USGS and Caltech are, are, are anticipating a large earthquake, which will start at the Salton Sea just east of us here, just east of the power plant, and rupture up the San Andreas Fault with a very large earthquake. They don't know if there will be other earthquakes on these other parallel faults. One of them is the one right offshore in front of the power plant. The message that we're conveying to the city councils is that you wouldn't want to run a power plant even under peak operating conditions where everything's meticulously maintained knowing that that's happening. You would absolutely never consider running a damaged power plant with a damaged cooling system knowing that you've got an earthquake of this magnitude that my understanding it could happen at any time between this afternoon and 30 years. By 30 years, I believe it's 90 something percent chance of this earthquake happening. There, the power plant is trying to re get relicensing for another 20 years of operation. What the community is asking of city councils and is asking of our state uh, public utilities commission, the governor, and the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission is to please shut this power plant down, keep it shut down. It's shut down right now because of its own internal failings, mechanical failings. Keep it shut down. It's not worth starting it up again. It was near the end of its useful lifespan without relicensing. It should be kept offline and decommissioned at this point. The risk just is not worth uh, uh, starting it back up to save uh, a few hundred million dollars of investment for Edison. Maybe one of the most serious things about the potential disaster at San Onofre nuclear disaster is that we don't have a viable 
emergency response plan and we don't have a viable evacuation plan for the communities surrounding the power plant. And again, I say that's 8.4 million people. That 8.4 million people is in the hub of the eighth largest economy in the world, which is California's economy. The emergency response plan for a disaster at San Onofre, the first uh, line of defense is called shelter in place. The shelter in place strategy doesn't take into consideration that there's a good chance that what triggers a nuclear disaster at San Onofre would be a megaquake. When you have a megaquake, my experience living here through several large earthquakes in California, is building envelopes are compromised. You get separations of roofs and walls, you get walls buckling, you get roofs caving in, you get windows shattering. It's absolutely impossible to shelter in place in a damaged building envelope. You are, you are completely exposed to the radioactive plume that will follow. The second thing that we learned in, it was a September 8th blackout, September 8th of 2011, when San Onofre uh, had a station blackout. They scrammed the generators, uh, the, the, the reactors, and shut down San Onofre very rapidly. What ensued after that was a complete blackout of this portion of Southern California and Northern Mexico, and I believe out into Las Vegas. It happened within a few seconds. All the traffic signals in this entire area went out, and we had gridlock within a few minutes. You couldn't get across this town. This town's a mile and a half. You couldn't get across this town in an hour. How would they evacuate anybody under those conditions at San Onofre? They wouldn't. So the second strategy is to evacuate which is impossible. We had an emergency management uh, uh, director for San Diego County speak at the Encinitas City Council a couple weeks back. And he told us that basically our emergency plan for a major nuclear disaster at San Onofre is that we are supposed to stay at home, watch our televisions, and they'll tell us which direction to run, depending on which way the wind is blowing. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but that sounds like an absolutely insane idea for evacuation of 8.4 million people. When we look at these nuclear disasters, and we look at the exclusion zones that are created from these nuclear disasters, in other words, everything that falls in the path of the radioactive plume that comes out of these disasters, what it does is it wipes out these areas. It, it, you evacuate these areas permanently. They're, they, they'll be evacuated for generations like we see around Chernobyl. We'll see the same thing around Fukushima. Those land improvements that get wiped out represent about 35% of our nation's wealth, which is manifest in the built environment, in the public infrastructure, the public buildings, the private buildings and improvements on land, all of that gets wiped out. Also, California is, is a huge percentage, produces a huge percentage of the nation's fruits and vegetables. In fact, we have just east of, east of uh, San Onofre, we have wineries, we have huge agricultural areas. The dairy portion of Southern California is just east of San Onofre. So all of that gets wiped out too.